As we do this for you, this is about taking ideas from Jeff Beck's mind, from you being with him and touring with him and working with him, and delivering this tribute to him in the process. So I'm going to start with, with uh, Rhonda. I'm going to start with you, Rhonda. Okay? In the beginning stages, here you you got your career going on. Jeff Beck reaches out to you. How did that all begin? Well, surprisingly enough, considering who's sitting to my left, if it wasn't for this man right here, I wouldn't have had the introduction or the job, really. It was from the kindness of his heart and his great mind that he suggested to Jeff, without even us ever playing together, Narada and I had never played together before, and he suggested to Jeff that I might be a good choice. So um, I'm always, I've always been indebted to him, and he knows I love him anyway. He's the king, <laughs> but that really started with with Narada um, and his graciousness. So um, without him, it wouldn't have happened. He suggested it to Jeff, and Jeff took him up on it, and then we went from there. We started auditions. They auditioned me in in Burbank at Center Staging. Uh, I brought every bass I had, <laughs> acoustic, fretless, everything. And um, it just went from there. We had a great day, and it was just it was just great. And I did my homework, you know. But um, that's how it that's how it originally started. What was your audition like? It was great because all they needed was a bass player. Everybody knew their parts already, and everybody was into it. So uh, it was a great rehearsal of running down everything. And it's funny because I was doing another gig when when Harvey had got in touch with me, who was his manager at the time. And I was in New York with a, with an artist called Catherine McPhee, who's, I think she's married to David Foster yes. now. And we were doing a lot of really early morning shows for a new record that she had out that I also played on with her. And they said, you know, come and do this. And really all I had to learn the show was, was the tape from uh, Live at Ronnie Scott's, that's it. Interesting. And so I was learning it all in the hotel room. Didn't have an amp. Only had my bass, and a little and a little player that I was playing it on. So I just had to. I just learned pretty much that whole show down. And then we just ran it when we when we went there. And it was just. It was wonderful. They, like Narada, all of them, Jeff, Jason. It was just a wonderful spirit. It was just as soon as I stepped into it, I knew, oh, this is where I need to be. It's really comfortable, and everybody was just so gracious. And it was just like a family like it always is when, when you make a good connection with people that you tour with you know, and spend time with. So it was just, it was just lovely, it was magical. It and like we never stopped. 2010 was a very, that was 2010, it was a very, very busy year from right. the time that we started with the Grammys, we started with the Grammys right away and then we went on a tour with Eric Clapton, we yes. did the double bill and then we were just all over the place for, for a good two years, yeah, the two first two years, two yeah, two and a half years, all, all over the world, very busy. How intense when you think about it. it. Was great. Robert, what was it like with you when, uh, when you made the connection with Johnny Depp? How did that all work out? Very peculiar for me. <laughs> In fact, I feel like quite a fraud being up here at all with these incredible musicians. I don't have the legacy of years at all. I had come to Los Angeles quite fresh. And um, I mean, the Johnny Depp things, aside from this, I, I just happened to meet his nephew and he asked, he said, my, my uncle's really going to like you. And I was like, That'll never work, no, whatever. Um, but the first call I did actually get was um, to, to turn up and he didn't really tell me what was going on other than naming Jeff Beck as someone he was going to collaborate with. I thought, that is, that is extraordinary. And again, I don't really deserve to be here. But we put together a bunch of demos that night and, um, and one of the demos we put together was a, a cover of uh, Isolation, uh, the, the John Lennon song. And I, I played all the piano parts out and Johnny played some drums and we put it all together. And then the end of that night, it just disappeared over the internet to Jeff Beck. And I, that, that's kind of where a lot of this began. Um, I then met Rhonda for the first time at rehearsals where you were preparing for some US dates. And sure enough, there they were rehearsing isolation. This time Jeff had taken over the piano parts. I was rubbed off the record, of course. <laughs> he was playing it all on guitar. As a piano, you're playing, you know, you have 10 fingers and you're playing these complex chords and Jeff could just dance around the fretboard and play it like a piano. I couldn't believe it. all the little chromaticisms because, you know, this is a different instrument, but he could vocalize it in a way that, that just, just clicked. 
And uh, in those rehearsals, we recorded everything. And of course, we actually ended up with final recordings. So the version of Isolation that's on the internet now is just a rehearsal take. Vinny playing drums, Rhonda playing bass, and, and Jeff. And then one overdub and you're done. Incredible. But pretty magical when you think about it. First of all, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, you're talking in a British accent. That lifts the crowd a little. <laughs> I'm just putting it on. It's a good currency over here. That adds a lot of class to the act. Thank you so much. <laughs> how kind of him to do that, right? That's very nice. But it's amazing how Jeff had the ability of being able to be that adaptable of his knowledge of the instrument. Knowledge? He, he, knew, yeah, he knew more than all of us. He's yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, it just shocked me in how he would approach... A lot of the stuff when we performed live, I was so stunned to see that every night from my seat, he would play the songs differently, mm -hmm. as if he wasn't already exceptional enough. Um, and that was a, a joy to work with, yeah. He challenged himself to, to surprise himself and all of us at the same time. Beautiful. Jennifer, you, uh, you know, were with him for those years, and you know, you're going from Michael Jackson out to Jeff Beck. Just tell us about how that all started out. Well, I joke that I stalked him. <laughs> when I found out that Michael Jackson was going to do the Dangerous Tour, I knew we were going to England, and I go, he lives there. I know he lives there somewhere, and I'm going to find him. And after every show we did with Michael, I would ask the Sony reps that were hanging out after if there was any connection, and could I invite him to a show? And finally, somebody came through, and he got VIP tickets, VIP parking. Two opening acts went on. Um, this was at Wembley Stadium. And then Michael canceled. Oh. Of all dates, he canceled for some reason. And I was devastated. And I thought, oh, God, of all nights. And uh, so 80,000 pissed off people are leaving the stadium. <laughs> and they got the band, which is all in full makeup, into um, a bus and closed the curtains so nobody could see who it was because it could be dangerous if people are mad. I wasn't having it. I thought Jeff was in the VIP tent and all these people are coming out and I'm going across him with my hair three feet high <laughs> going, man, I'm going to meet this man one way or another. And as it turns out, he was turned away at the gate. Uh, he just came for the, the main act. And I called him and said, you know, I don't know when or if they're going to make up this show, but can I meet you anyway? And he said, sure. And I went the next day and met him at the uh, Townhouse Studios in London where he was recording his Rockabilly record. And I had, I mean, this is so many years ago, I had one of those old school video cameras long before the smartphone. And I, I listened to what he was doing. And at a break, I asked him if he could play Blue Wind because I had learned every song, every solo on Blow by Blow and Wired. And I wanted him to play that for me. And it just, it's, it's like the heavens opened up. I, I had a battery that lasted 10 seconds, but in those 10 seconds, I learned so much because although I was playing the same notes that he was playing on the record, he played them differently. And I saw these microscopic bends he was doing. I was going, oh, that's the sound, <laughs> you know? We hung out for a couple hours after and it was actually a little bit awkward because although I knew all his music, I didn't know him as a person. This was long before social media, and the only thing I knew was the odd interview on the radio that you had to stay up for. You know, it, was, yeah. it wasn't archived on the internet. Uh, or there was a, a boutique record shop I used to go to that would get British magazines, and I would go through them for hours looking for anything on Jeff. And thank God I had two friends with me to keep the conversation going. So, I mean, that was my bucket list to get to get an autograph. And I left him with a, my debut CD that had just come out. And I had also done a video for Flight of the Bumblebee where I was covered with 100,000 bees, like you do. <laughs> and and uh, MTV was showing it at the time. And they, they gave me a copy along with an interview. And you can't play that format VHS in America. So I gave that to him as well and got my uh, autograph. And I, I will say... I was on my way, except that he drove me back to the hotel in his Batmobile <laughs> going, you know, any time he had 600 yards free without cars, he'd be flooring it. Oh, my God. And I thought, man, if I'm going to die in a fiery, fiery car crash, this is the way to go. <laughs> it, it doesn't get more rock and roll than this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I thought that was the end of it. I'd never see him again. And... He called me a month or so later and said, I finally had a chance to listen to your record properly and let's record together. And I just peed my pants. I mean, 
you know, that wasn't even a dream I had because he didn't play with other guitar players. Yeah. So, at, well, it was actually five years before it happened, but I, I would see him backstage at, at various tours he was doing, and he'd always say, we're going to do this thing. And I, I would think, well, I know how it's when somebody's in your face, you know, and then you get inspiration, and then you're onto this or onto that. He called. He said, we have a tour in Italy, and come play. And I thought, are you bonkers? We've never even played together. I mean, he, at that point, he had the faith of my first two records to go on. But still, it, you don't know how much trickery went on in recording. And <clears throat> so I forced an audition on myself in that. I had a, a session I was doing in Milan, and I figured as long as I'm over there, I'm going to fly down. I learned most of the guitar shop record, and I went to his house and played it just to make sure he wasn't bonkers. <laughs> you know? And that that night, I mean, I, I played, I don't know, three or four songs, and then he started playing with me. And then his wife, Sandra, brought out the whiskey at midnight. <laughs> And I had to fly out and do a session the next day, and it wasn't good. <laughs> but, man, we had a good time. So that's how it all began. It's pretty powerful when you think about just the, the intensity of his personality, of just how he led his life and how he dragged everyone along with him in that style of living. It's a pretty powerful message. Narada, you are such a special person at many different levels. I'd, I'd like you to just kind of explain to the audience how your name came about from Sri Chinoy. Okay. Uh, I was given the name Narda in 76, just before the release of my first solo album, Garden Love Light. In fact, just in time for that album. And um, when Guru gave me this name, uh, he told me he'd make me wait a long time to get a name. He didn't want to spoil me. And when I received my name, it was like he would say, No. Ra, da. That went on for so long, I didn't know if my name was Na, Ra, or Da. <laughs> until he said, Narda. Narda. He said, Narda's soul brings from heaven to earth light, delight, and compassion, and takes back to heaven from earth, earth sufferings. So the music, this is what my name means. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, that's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. Now tell us about just, you know, again, how you met Jeff and how that all started. I'm so blessed. First of all, I want to say I'm happy to be here. Rhonda, Jennifer, Robert, we're all just uh, ecstatic to be here to honor Jeff. I have to just say that right, right off the top. I was not able to go to the funeral in London and all that. I know Rhonda, we're here to honor Jeff in our best way at this time. Absolutely. So here we are. So I'm going to go back now on the time machine. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you again, I'm really super, super blessed. We all are, but when you hear this story, you'll see what I'm saying. Because I was with a band called Mahavishnu Orchestra. That in itself is, is a miracle. Uh, just an absolute miracle. So after the making of the second album called Visions of the Emerald Beyond, we were going to do a tour, uh, another, a second tour. And on this tour would be Jeff Beck, Blow by Blow album. He was like hot with a blow by blow. And his band had Bernard Purdy and uh, Max Middleton. So I got a chance to watch Jeff every night. Uh, and then we jammed together. The bands, Bernard Purdy and myself would jam together. Both bands would jam together at the very end. And I had a chance to really kind of work with and kind of figure Jeff's vibe of, he was a blues cat. Like I loved Jimmy in high school. He had that Jimmy in him too. So I loved all that. And then as we toured around more, uh, we, I made my last album with the Mahavishnu called Inner Worlds. And during the making of that album, I was asked to come to London to make an album with Jeff. And so I said, okay. So I flew to London from France to make Wire. And when I got there, they had a song called Lead Boots. In the little basement it was. Maybe Max Middleton's basement. Some little basement was the bass player, Max, and Jeff. And a little tiny kit. I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, these big rock stars, a little tiny basement. But that's what it was. <laughs> But I'm so glad I brought my cassette machine with me because I, I stumbled upon this pattern. And I record that cassette because during the time of then recording the song with George Martin at the, the studio, I'd forgotten the pattern. I'm so happy I had the cassette machine to remind myself of that pattern because I would have blown it then, you see. 
So we, we cut rod, we cut the lead, lead boots, and then Jeff said, we need more material. So across town at Trident Studios is John McLaughlin, my vision of mixing inner worlds. I went down by the piano and God blessed me with music of Sophie, come dancing, play with me, which I knew uh, would be right for Jeff because I toured with him, you see. I knew the funk on the bottom with Stevie-ish type changes and that he can do the raw thing on top. It's a perfect blend for him. So then he, that's how he made Wired. It just came together like magic, boom. And to work with a Beatles producer, George Martin was great. It's just so kind and patient and, and very loving of Jeff. And I watched Jeff then do like solos, like 10 solos. And maybe eight would be the ones we'd like, Jim just trying stuff. But maybe the nine or 10 would be the record, like just pow. <laughs> you know, I would, I'd be amazed by him. And also I watched him then do like different things of different guitars for different parts of a song. This would be a verse. This would be a, a chorus. This would be the second verse. Just trying different things. I, I had never experienced that before either. So that was wired. Then going on, I have to say about Jeff. Two more things. One, playing with Sting in Carnegie Hall. He came to do Jimi Hendrix Purple, Purple Haze and with Patty, Aust, Patty LaBelle Superstition. We reunited again. How powerful it was to play Carnegie Hall with him. And him let him rip. You don't understand. Rip. Then it came time. I didn't see him for a long time. He had released this Emotion Commotion album and said, you do this rainforest so well with the orchestra and all that. My Emotion Commotion's got orchestra. Come tour. I said, I've been waiting for 35 years for you to ask me that. We had never toured. I mean, as far as, you know, like when early, early days. So he said, bass player, who do you know? And he had, he had a towel. He had a high standard going on. I said, you know Rhonda Smith from Prince? He goes, wow. <laughs> so we decided we'd meet up in LA. He, he flew over and he brought the keeper, the keeper cat, Jason Rubello, hot shot. And Rhonda came and we jammed and it was just beautiful. And that band, I'm telling you, in my life has gone so high in the blues and the depth of it so powerfully. I call her Earth Mother because she holds it down, <laughs> lets it fly. And Jeff adores her right to the end. And I want to say one more thing. Early in my life with Jeff, he wasn't as consistent. But I'm going to tell you something. He played all the time. So that on this tour with Emotion Commotion, that Jeff, every show would be fire. For two and a half years, every show would be fire. And some even more than fire, but always consistent. That's what shocked me. We could be sick. We could be tired of being on those damn buses and how traveling is hard on you. But he plugged that Marshall's in, make that big roar he makes, and, and the accuracy, and we kick it with him, and he could just go. So beautiful. Every, I never had to worry about that. Am I right, Rhonda? You are absolutely right. Absolutely right. So in testimony to Jeff, I have to just say that Ralph the Jump Street, what I love the most is his rawness, his love like a kid for the music, and just, just play it hardcore. And one more thing I gotta say before you cut me off. Yeah, go ahead. No, not at all. There's go one on. more thing I gotta say, just to show you how his devotion. I love the jam of Hendrix's Little Wing. Mm. He loved it too. But guess what? He wouldn't just go and play it. It took Jeff like almost a six month period of playing it every day to figure out how he wanted to approach Little Wing. He wouldn't just go out and play it. We went half a year almost just experimenting with it before we finally broke it out. That's when I realized his devotion is so deep. Always playing on the buses, always playing, always playing before the, before the, the show, always playing. And love people, love this. If he was here, he would love all this. Thank you. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> now you can see when Narda talks about Jeff being at fire, you can see Narda is above that at nuclear meltdown. 
see what happens. This is the energy that he brings to it all. Tell me about, well, first of all, his sound and his amplification setup was kind of unique, right? He had like speakers facing back and, can, can one of you explain that, how his setup was? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Jen, yeah, go ahead. I don't know what I saw, but... Yeah. <laughs> when I was with him, he first started a thing where he would slave off of the marshals, so he actually had greenback marshals facing him as well as behind him, and then the side fills. So it was glorious surround sound. Hmm. It was amazing. What I understand is Jeff also played drums. He was a drummer, too. So he really kind of came from this rhythmical, melodic place. But he, he played kind of loud on stage. Was it, did he have a loud volume on stage? Uh, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> you mean guitar? <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Was that a part of his sound? <laughs> how, how, just talk about that for a second. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I have hearing, honestly, because I didn't use in-ears. But the last, the last two years that I worked with him, I did use some ear protection, but he was, I think he had tinnitus and he had some other hearing issues, yeah. but he played extremely loud, extremely loud, very loud, <laughs> very, very loud. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I loved it. Come on, talk about it. But. Am absolutely amazing, amazing sound, of course. But I mean, he, he was the king. It was that's his right. stage. That's, right. that, that's how it should be. But yes, it was dominant. It was Jeff Beck and as it should have been, but it was loud. Yes, it was the most pervasive thing that it should have been. He was pushing it, absolutely. Oh. Jen. I would try to use earplugs, but he would, <laughs> he would go from 11 down to a whisper. And so I, I gave up on that and just let my ears suffer. But I will say his tone was incredible. the most incredible tone in the world. And it could never be too loud for me. Now the bass and drums could be too loud for me. <laughs> interesting. No offense. Interesting, very interesting, very interesting. Robert, what was it like as a, as a keyboard player on stage with that sound? Oh, I was the other side of the stage, so I don't know, Rhonda, how you... And you had in, you had in ears, right? Of course. Yes. Of course. He had Gotta in protect these babies. I was between Jeff and either Narada or yeah. Vinny, oh, you yeah. know, with no in ears. So it was, yes. it was an experience. That's right. That's it was right. an experience. That's right. Yeah. But that's the only way to do it. It's rock and roll, baby. It's yeah, got to do it, it like really that. Is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It really is. So I want to go down, down the aisle. Now, let's talk about now you're on stage performing with him. What was the vibe, you know, when, when, when he started playing? What did you kind of learn or discover from that? I'll start with Robert. What, what did you feel from his presence on stage performing? Um, unpredictability, for sure. I mean, we, it's very unusual for me to see the show be so free. We could really extend songs. And yeah, he loved unpredictability and changes going on. So a lot of the time, I was just yeah, just keeping an eye on him, keeping an eye on Rhonda. Rhonda was my band leader. I was like, <laughs> holding it down because Jeff could just add, just at the drop of a hat, just want to just extend sections and go off and, and do all sorts. So yeah, very inspiring to see someone again, like I said before, just changing, constantly evolving. So that spur of the moment, that improvisational yeah, was the foundation of a lot of what he did, right? I would say without doubt. And it, it follows back to the studio as well, where, I mean, a lot of the times when people are recording, they're sort of aiming for an end goal. But Jeff didn't really concern himself with that. He just was there to experiment and try things. So, you know, he'd play down a version of the song, and then he'd say, uh, give me another. And then he'd play down a completely new version of the song. Yeah. And, <laughs> and sort of, what do you think of that then? And he asked me, like I, I like, <laughs> like I needed to give him feedback. And, and absolutely incredible. And several times, yeah, you do this multiple times, you end up with sort of three or four takes that are all equally brilliant. Um, the standard is so, so high. And uh, then you just potter off and just say, all right, make something out of that. <laughs> you know, you're off dealing with the cars or, uh, you know, hanging out with the animals or something like that. He didn't, he didn't really want to fuss over the details. He just... <laughs> Right. I think the cool thing about him was when, for instance, I'll compare him to Prince, which is apples and oranges, uh, a, a star, who, a great guitar player who was in more of a pop genre. 
when he would go into classic solos like Purple Rain or something like that, played it the same way, same solo every night because he believed that that's, it was pop record. That's what people wanted to hear. That's what they knew. So it should be like that. Of course, Jeff Beck was completely the opposite. He never played the same thing twice, especially when it came to solos, which was an amazing thing because he was soloing so much, you know, in a show. It was, sometimes his hands were falling off, you know. It was incredible what he was doing, but never a repetition, never, you know, never repeating a, a motif or anything. It was always, always something fresh and new, which was amazing to watch and hear, obviously. And it seems like every performance was like this. Everyone. What a standard. Jen, what was it like with yourself, I mean, as a guitar player playing with another guitarist, what did you have to adapt to play with him that way? <laughs> well, the, the first time we got together was in SIR in New York, and the original band w was going to be Terry Bozio and Tony Levin. And I walked in thinking there would be a keyboard player, and it's, I'm it. And I thought, man, I mean, that's a lot of faith and it ain't gonna work. <laughs> and I, I thought all, you know, Max Middleton, Jan Hammer, Tony Hymas, guitar is not gonna cut it. So I immediately really dove down deep into guitar synthesizer to try to recreate those sounds. Interesting. And I, I was happy to do it. You don't really need two guitar players on stage with a Jeff Beck, although I, I did play guitar uh, maybe 20% of the time, oh, but mostly it was, it was support with guitar synthesizer. Um, if we weren't trading solos or like that, but yeah, I mean, I, I told him I'd, I don't need a solo. I'd, I'll polish your boots. <laughs> you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll work for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, that, that's amazing to experience that. So you had to kind of figure out other effects for your instruments. So you had to kind of step into a different world. I had the most ridiculous amount of crap under my feet. Oh my God. I mean, I had, you know, guitar pedal board and a wah and a whammy, and then I had two different volumes for different physical keyboard modules. And I always felt every time we went out that just one more week just to get repetition for my feet. Because yeah. I just didn't want to play because we ended as lovers and have trumpets come out instead of an orchestra. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it was treacherous, but yeah. And then, and then he looked over at all the crap I had and he would start bringing in a new pedal every day and he goes, look, I'm building a pedal garden. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been an exciting time, right? It's, it's, oh my God, it was three years, it was so intense and so fun and so joyous. Just, you know, just to be hanging out on the bus with him, listening to music, and hearing his opinions, yeah. or in the studio. You know, you don't need another guitar player on a Jeff Beck record, although he had me on a few things. I'd be there for six or eight hours in the studio, and he'd say one thing, and I'd go, ah. Oh, oh. That's why I was here all day. Mm. Just pearls of wisdom that were so meaningful and will stay with me forever. That's beautiful, beautiful. Rhonda, what was it like playing bass now? Now you're on bass now, you're laying that foundation down. What was that like with him on stage? It was, it was incredible. Um, you know, there were always great drummers. Uh, he was the greatest icing on the cake. Um, I got to play the basses that I wanted to play. I got, see, the thing with, with, with Jeff was that if he had you in his band, he trusted you. He didn't question what you did. He just knew if you were there that you were gonna do what you needed to do, sound-wise, part-wise. Um, pretty much everything. So that freedom for me was really wonderful, especially from recently coming out of a, like a Prince camp, which was a completely different, yeah. different thing. Um, so it, it was amazing. Again, I too had a huge pedal board, a lot of things, um, but chose that I used everything wisely and was able to use a lot of different instruments with him. And that's what I loved, even when we started with the group with Narada in 2010. We played such a scope of music, you know, from, from every, almost every style we went to and, and the band could handle it. And it was great going from being able to play fretless, being able to play acoustic, being able to play funk, being able to play just blues, uh, R&B, whatever. I mean, it was... Um, it was incredible, especially with, with that, those caliber of musicians. It was, uh, we, we covered everything and it was just a dream come true. So this allowed you to kind of step further out of your comfort zone. 
Absolutely. <laughs> and the great thing about it for me is at that time, it was a smaller group. It was only four people. Yeah. So it allowed me to take a, a bigger role, a bigger chunk. I wasn't, I wasn't competing with keyboard, bass. I wasn't competing with, with other things or, or you know, seven or eight people in the band you, you know, where everything has its place. It was more of an expandable thing for me, which was great for my soul. And it was great for me as a musician also, that, that he allowed me to have that liberty. That gave you more space. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that can be a bad thing yeah. <laughs> for some people, but for bass players, for me, it was a great thing. He trusted me, and, and I felt like I did him right. You know, Whoa. I felt like I did him right. That's right. Well, it really sounds like it, he had a, a way of, when well, you mentioned trust, you know, when you're on that stage in his situation where you're, sometimes the music was improvisational, so you didn't know where you were going, there had to be trust. Yeah. There had to be belief that the team that I'm with can handle where I'm going, and I'm not sure where I'm going. Sure, but we always had this understanding, and I did, ease, even as, you know, earlier this year or when we toured at the end of last year, that it's really all about Jeff. We all knew that, that we're, it's about protecting him, covering him wherever he goes. We go and we work as a team to make him sound and support him in the best way possible. And we always did that regardless of the configuration of the band or who was in it. You know, that was how it was. It wasn't a, it wasn't a I, me, my thing. You know, it was, it was about him supporting him. How beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Nada, what was it like on stage playing with him? Just kind of describe that story. Yeah, what I want to say is that <clears throat> there's one show in particular, for some reason this is my spirit saying, talk about this. We went to, uh, with Rhonda, to the um, New Orleans Jazz. And it had just been after Katrina. So we played our show, but there's a song in the set but don't 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 Interesting. People had to purge to get that suffering off of them of Katrina, what had come down. So you had to just wait. But that's the power of what Jeff had, that medicine in his playing, in his spirit, mm. to free that pain off of them with the blues. Yeah, yeah. Rhonda, say something about that. Yeah. <laughs> I know you know. It's so true. But yeah. music is a healer. He was a musical healer. He was a doctor. A travel. We were all traveling doctors. But you know, we worked for his his business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was a physician, and we did that. He was a healer. He was a healer, and it was it was it was just incredible. Especially during that time, that was a really emotional time when we Very were in emotional. New Orleans. It Very was emotional. it was crazy. It was crazy. And for example, just something that you might not know, like a little tidbit on the bus you talked about. He would say, uh, if, if, on, if a song came on the radio, like um, The Long and Winding Road by Beatles, yeah. he might get teary-eyed. Yeah. Those type of things I remember. He's and very, he loved Motown. Oh, well, of course. Oh, my well, of God. course, well, of course. And James Brown. Oh, yeah. And James Brown. Okay. Cold, cold sweat. Yeah, cold sweat. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing. Not a, drumistically, what was it like playing with him? Because Ooh, drumistically, kind of, drumistically, drumistically. drumistically. Yeah. By the way, yeah. I, I, I got to show yourself. You. Ron, help me. I'm wearing what we wore live in honor of Jeff. In honor of Jeff. Get it. This is how we'd be on the stage and rocking it. Drumistically, <laughs> uh, Jeff loves drums and loves power. Uh, has to have power to compete with the amplification. And um, <clears throat> two things I have to say. Mahavishnu Jama McLaughlin, professor, taught me to listen. His whole thing was listen, 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 listen. Okay, that's it. He got that from Miles Davis. So that really did me well with Jeff because you're not sure what Jeff's going to do. So you have to really always listen. But the thing about Jeff I found, that I loved, was... Um, I could kind of feel what he's going to do. Almost like buddies. 
Like some people, you have to, you're not really sure what, you know, okay. But with Jeff, it, I could, I, yeah, it would all make sense to me. He would give some space. He'd play his thing. You know, there was room to like do call and answer. Shut it up. There was room to do stuff. Drumistically. Yeah, drumistically. <laughs> but, but he played, he played off drummers. He played off of you. Jeff didn't listen to the keyboard player. No, no disrespect. He, he listened to the drummer. He's, he had a connection with the drummer first and foremost. And that's, that's where it was. Yeah. Everything else was kind of secondary, but he had a connection with the drummers always. How like a back and forth thing. And Rod is absolutely right with that. I, I have a little story about his emotional investment. Yes. We were playing in Rio and the two of us were doing Where Were You, which is a real, very sensitive ballad. And he broke a string and usually his texts were right on it, got him a new guitar and he was still in the moment. And then the new guitar was screwed up. The jack was like Rrr! And he was so distraught over it, he took his guitar and smashed it into the stage. And I'm sitting there holding a chord going, okay, what's next? I've heard about this behavior, but I've never been a part of it. <laughs> and the thing is, he was so into the message he was sending out to have that interrupted upset him so much that he smashed the guitar and walked off the stage. And I saw him backstage and he was just so upset. It, it took him a while to collect himself. But that, that's the investment that yeah, he would yeah. put into the music. It was so deep. And I, I have never been that moved by a musician ever. Boy, that even, even, even like twin amplifiers. He would try the twin amplifiers and get so upset because he wasn't happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to go back to Marshall. Yeah. I have to say that. But you know what? He would give anything for his audience. And I'll give you two examples because he, I've, I've, in all the years I've been with him, I've never experienced him being overly late or doing anything crazy. We did this crazy show with this promoter one time after he left Harvey in, in Iceland. And the promoter was jacked up. And he knew before we were about to go on that he wasn't going to get paid for the show. We were already there, the people were there. Jeff, from the kindness of his heart, said, you know what, let's just play anyway mm -hmm. for the people. That's right. He did that. Another time we were in Italy, probably uh, four or five years ago, he started having his nose, just started bleeding profusely the whole time before the show. He was covered in blood. It wouldn't stop. They brought medics. They tried to catarize his nose. They couldn't get the bleeding to stop. We were an hour and maybe 20 minutes late for that show, still waiting, and his nose was still bleeding. He took some Kleenex, stuffed it up his nose, and went and did the show. He was miserable, but his white strat was covered in blood, mm. as was he, but the show must go on. That's what kind of guy he was, too. How beautiful, you know, that, that emotional content, really, that's beautiful. <laughs> Jennifer, once he brought you in, then, Rhonda, you followed uh, Lizzie Borden, was a violinist he used very often, and Annika Niles. Lizzie Ball. L Lizzie? Lizzie Borden, that's funny. <laughs> Freudian slip, <laughs> Lizzie <laughs> Ball. <laughs> Thanks. But I mean, so he, he really, he liked that, that balance, I guess is what it was, right? I never questioned it. Yeah. He said, join the band, I said, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, we, I don't think we ever had a conversation about female musicians. I, I remember there was an article that he was talking about how rock was such a boys club. Yeah. And uh, I don't think he ever considered a female until he did. Yeah. And it, that, it, you know, it might have been Prince having Wendy and Lisa back in the day. And that, I think, is what inspired Michael Jackson. And then, you know, once. But you were the first. Damn right. Damn right <laughs> Take it. Take, Take, Take it, girl. Take it. <laughs> Incredible. Robert, I'll go back down to you. What do you think Jeff looked for in you? What was it about you that in your playing or that he, he looked, what, what was the quality in you that he, he found? Um, stability and I think a sense of humor with a lot of... Uh, the extraordinary things that he needed. I mean, when he asked me to perform, I remember I'm coming off just usually sitting in the studio as a recording engineer, 
was very generous to allow me to have a, a sort of co-production credit on the record as well. There was a lot of uh, going over to his house with a laptop and setting up in his little den and uh, and helping him record. And and then you know, I if the if the needed a little piano added to a song or a little keyboard of some sort, I just throw it down discreetly in the background. I didn't realize he was really paying attention to that. And then when it came to finding a way to present the record on stage, um, yeah, he he said just very timidly, I was always very timid in asking things. You know, said, would, would you would you mind if would you mind coming and, and performing on on stage? I, I my my jaw dropped. I couldn't I couldn't believe that he would he could call anybody. But I think it was just that little bit of stability of someone who you know, had been with the record and, and the trust thing, I think, is mm. very key. And also, he seemed to love giving people an opportunity, yeah. bringing up new talent. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm here speaking to you guys with How these beautiful. Three. beautiful. It's only because of Jeff. But this, this really rounds out in tributing Jeff the fact that you all are here in the honor of his presence, which is still with us. What was the Johnny Depp connection and how did you, how did they get along, Jeff and Johnny? Oh, they coined the phrase elderly toddlers. <laughs> um, because they were just, oh my God, I was the grown up in the room. It was a ridiculous <laughs> thing. <laughs> Honestly, the joy of spending the nights um, just working on music with them, just, just unbelievable, just 20 year olds. and. The, some of the sessions would happen in Los Angeles when Jeff would be over. He'd stay with Johnny, and I'd just, you know, just be there to hit record if if necessary. But a lot of it was just hanging out and just just listening to records together and just telling stories. And oh my goodness, the stories! Hearing Jeff talk about Jimi Hendrix, yeah, can you believe that? Yeah, someone who knew Jimi personally, and and hearing Jeff just and oh, and just playing music together, always Motown, like you said, James Brown, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then on the on the flip side, we'd do a lot of recording in England at Jeff's house as well. So, I, again, I'd bring a, a laptop in. I don't think either of them really wanted to be in a big, expensive studio or any kind of. So apologies to anyone that owns the studio, and would have loved to have Jeff in your studio. He just wanted his own little space to be creative without any judgment. I think he was quite aware. Most places he went, people looked at him. They recognized he was Jeff Beck, and perhaps. He'd have to dance that dance, but he just, he wasn't really interested. He enjoyed the space of being at home. He had his alarm chair in what he called the sewing room at the mill house. And I would just bring in a laptop and some speakers, keep it all simple. And always the amplifier in the room with him. That was a key. A lot of times in recording, you put the amplifier into another room. Um, but he liked being close to it to get the, you know, the gauge over the feedback and actually have the instrument be a part of him. So we just sort of put a load of pillows around it to try and like isolate the sound as much as possible. And yeah, just barrels of laughter. It was a lot of fun. How powerful, how very, very powerful. What was it like, I gotta go around, musical advice. What did you pull from him in being with him and performing with him and learning from him? What kind of musical advice? Rhonda, I'll start with you, Rhonda. What, what did you, musically, how did that maybe change your playing or change your perspective? Well, I, I I just think that that playing on that level for, you know, that many years it just just does it, especially with somebody like that. Um, I think one of the best experiences that I have was having his playing over the years and his feel rub off on me and the playing that I am, in some of the soloing that I do and some of the things that have changed me over the years with him. Um, I I don't think you can help. Um, being around somebody so brilliant for it not to permeate, you know, on you. So um, that is one of the biggest things that I've learned, you know, for, for just, just getting some of his feel and just just being around that brilliance. But also that he was just a beautiful man. He was just a beautiful person. He had a great heart. He was really funny. And he was really, really great to be around. And it was th those are the kind of situations where you go, man, and you paying me to, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just such a joy to do that. You know, it was, it was more than music. You know, we were family, we were friends. Yeah. That's why it, it's, it's really painful to, uh, 
that he's not here anymore and very very unexpected and, and very quick but he he left me with with a lot of great things but those are those are two of them the love for him and the, and the love he had for music the honesty about it and just his amazing feel i used to have a dressing room next to him a lot of the times and he would play some of the most amazing stuff through the years through his little tiny amp in his dressing room when he was just warming up and I'll tell the truth, sometimes I would take my cell phone out and put it out and just record because, I mean, the stuff that he was playing. I, I, I used to tell him sometimes, I don't know if you were reincarnated in another life and you had, you've been just screwed over a, 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 a former slave or something <laughs> for you to get that much, for you just that much feel, that much... That, you know, I, it's just unexplainable how he was. And it, you just can't help but have that permeate over to you. So I'm extremely grateful to have been able to work with that master. Beautiful, you know? beautiful. Narda. Yeah. I want to say that <clears throat> Jeff kept jazz rock fusion alive think about that from 75 we did a piece called eternity's breath when i got back with jeff on the tour with miranda we're still playing eternity's breath he's playing spectrum of billy cobham he kept that whole sound popular with his audiences and the audiences were always packed they almost didn't really care so much what he's going to play they just want to hear whatever he wants to play but he chose to keep that spirit of adventure alive where a lot of it had died off, he kept it going. So I have to really credit Jeff on that. Wow. And then, okay, as a human being, I want to say one thing. I asked him this, this myself. I wanted to know what happened. After he had ma major success with Blow by Blow and Wired albums, platinum albums, right? And then Truth Goes Platinum. I go to his house to compose more music. I stay there by, by like, like a week. I'm writing a lot of music. And every day he'll come in the house and on his hands, grease from the cars. <laughs> That would happen every day. <laughs> so he never really wanted to play that week. So then later on I asked him, I said, whatever happened when I came that time to, you know, to, to write these new songs and carry on? He said, I lost my confidence. Wow. So I thought that was very telling. Genius, you know? But we all go through phases mm. to get up and go out and kick it. And he did. Yeah. That's why I want to say how great a man he is. Beautiful. Very humble. See what I'm saying? Very humble That's for that saying. amount of talent. Unbelievable. Saying. Robert, what musically did you did you pull in on stage from him? Musically, musically, it's a mind blowing to me. Absolutely, the, um, the breadth of 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 this, like like you say, the jazz fusion and stuff coming through. They didn't seem to be. I mean, there was a few songs that were mainstays in the set, but I'd. I'd, I'd sort of get the set list and you know, it was quite, quite a lot of music to learn. And I'd sort of dig around on the internet. I'd find your performances, Norana, yours, Jennifer, and I'd, I'd, I'd work out how, uh, what am I going to do? How am I going to fill this space? How am I going to be this steady ship of holding down stuff while Jeff does his amazing sort of magic tricks on stage? Um, and I was surprised that the set lists were so different. And I think that's a very true thing. The audience would come not in any way saying, oh, well, I... I must hear brush for the you know, brush for the blues this time. They would they would come, but with the respect of I just want to hear whatever Jeff wants to wants to play. And I thought that was very very inspiring. Beautiful. There's no greatest hits, is there? It's all good. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Jen, you know, one of the things I got from him is that he would listen to everything. And I, I often say he would listen to the Spice Girls and Ornette Coleman back to back and be able to pull something valuable from each of them. Interesting. You know, whether it was a snare EQ or a sound or something. And before that, there was plenty of stuff that I would go next, next, next. But to see him listen and, and to listen to his opinions, um, that, that changed me. He was open to anything. And having said that, I'd also see him listen to people's demos that were sent to him. And if, if he didn't hear something fresh in 16 bars, it was a Frisbee. Oh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> he experienced terrible. that. Well, I want to jump back to the nosebleed thing, too. Yeah. Because when I was with him, he broke his finger 
working on a car. Mm -hmm. He was pushing it uphill and slipped in grease and broke his, his, I think it was his middle finger of his left hand. Went to a doctor, doctor said it's fine. We go off on tour. Turns out it was broken the whole time. The doctor did not do an x-ray. And there was one show we did that I'll never forget it because we're in the middle of the show and he didn't know it was broken, but it was hurting him. And I think he pulled energy from somewhere and I felt like he, he's gonna levitate through this building and leave us behind. He was so on fire, like two nights in a row. It was just mind blowing. Yes. That's right. Where do you think that, that where, where did it come from? Where, where do you think knowing Jeff, where did that all come from from him? It's a God gift, man. God just blesses people like that, you know? There are certain individuals just have that burning fire. And he's one of them. You know, and he really wanted to impart that fire with everybody. And he was inspired. He would watch John McLaughlin and get turned on. Hmm. He'd watch his heroes get turned on. You know, he, again, we're talking about Hendrix. Hendrix turned him on. So many people that he loved. But he had that fire inside and uh, just really wanted to kick it out, man. And, he, and, and, and I got to say, rhythmically beautiful. We don't talk about it too much. But let me talk about it. I'm a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> His rhythm is beautiful. I mean, you hear stories about, okay, superstition, that drum group, that may have been Jeff out there playing that drum. Steve inspired Stevie. Stevie said, play that groove. Then he writes superstition on that groove because Jeff's got that, that, that black funk oh, up in man. there. He does. That's a part of why we love him, why he's famous, because he has the rock power and the street ghetto. And, and, and the blues. Totally. And he can mix it all up and spit it how he wants to spit it. And the stronger you play with him, the more he loves it. So I, just, I have a great affinity for him, um, for his tenderness as a person, and for his kindness. Mm. Yeah, I want him to, to know how kind Jeff is, yeah. Well, you mentioned Stevie Wonder. Yeah. He inspired Stevie, even in the, the Talking Book album. Yes. Uh, uh, looking for another pure love. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And 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 Stevie eventually came back and performed some stuff with him. They had another connection. I mean, you think of Stevie Wonder and Jeff Beck. It's a whole other connection that a normal person might not have visualized. But he saw the wideness of what music was about. Oh, okay. No, Stevie's heart's huge. Jeff and Stevie were very, very tight. They inspired each other tremendously. That's what I'm saying. Superstition is, is a lot of Jeff energy right there. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of Jeff energy. Yeah. So. And because we ended as lovers. And because we ended as lovers. About that. Because we ended as lovers, we, were, we played in China, like Hong Kong, whatever it was. And, and we, and we did the show, and we didn't play because we ended as lovers. And then, we, no, you can't leave yeah. without playing because we ended as lovers because there will be a riot. <laughs> so we had to go back on stage and play. Wow. Because we ended as lovers in China. They had to have it. Incredible. How, how, did, he choose, how did he choose songs for the set? How, how did he adapt the songs for the set? How, did, he, did he have a set list set up? Did you guys discuss that? How'd that work out? You know, that depends. That depends. Uh, towards the end, I think I picked the songs. <laughs> <laughs> and then he disregarded yeah, on stage at the just last minute. <laughs> do, then we would just do some switch arounds and, but with some suggestions. But uh, yeah, I think that the, towards the end, I can't remember how it was at the beginning. Do you remember how the, when, when yeah, we first started? I was, gonna, I was like, I was asking or? Harvey, I was like, how do we do the songs? He said, oh, just trust Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned to trust Jeff because and then he put together this thing. It would be it would work, every time it worked mm. because I, then I realized his fans didn't really matter so much about the order yeah. of things. As long as he's hitting it and doing his like thing, and especially this one song, I don't even know the title, but he takes the bar and goes up high off the, and plays all the melody. Angel Angel footsteps. Footsteps. What's, it, what's, it, what's it called? Angel's Footsteps. Angel's Footsteps. Incredible. That was always a, a, high, a highlight mm. of high walking thing going on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'd run over quite a few occasions where he would just start another completely different song, wouldn't he? And then I'd look at you and you'd look oh, at me yeah. and we'd be like, okay, on oh, a yeah. dime. Because oh, again, yeah. absolutely. again the idea supporting was him. support absolutely. him no matter what. Absolutely. And then, and then yeah. the question would be, are we going back to those yeah. songs? Are we having dinner early? What's, what's going on? Are we... <laughs> yeah, 
We had to be ready for anything, and we were, you know. So I guess he really enjoyed that spontaneity. He really felt, he almost like thrived for that. Yes. And I have to say something, it's on my spirit. Jan Hammer. Uh, Jan Hammer was a big inspiration for Jeff. He killed it on Wired. I, I, on all those Wired sessions, I never met Jan. He, that was all overdubbed. Everything Jan did was overdubbed. But then their connection was so strong that Jeff then took the album from George Martin, from London, to Jan's home, and then mixed the album and put it out. So Jan actually mixed that whole album. So their connection is really powerful. And again, Jan as a drummer, as a keyboard player, is genius. We have to go and say that about this kind, these type of people. They're just, they're one of a kind. Huge. And the fact that Jan did that show with him in 2018 at the Hollywood Bowl was huge. Because Jan doesn't travel that much anymore. So, And he did that for Jeff, which was major. And for Jeff, I think that was his favorite keyboard player of, of all times. I think he kind of, he, I think he learned a lot of stuff from Jan yes, in terms of soloing and trying to mimic guitar, the keyboard lines that Jan was doing. And back in the day, I think he, he got a lot from Jan and he, he loved Jan Hammer, absolutely, as we all do. Yeah. He was really inspired by his tone. Yeah. And, absolutely. And right. Tried to go for that, which reminds me, we, we played the Montreux Jazz Festival. That was one of our first shows that we played. And he was nervous and at soundcheck, he comes over to me and goes, I need a new sound. And I go, can I have your old one? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> well, Robert, it's got to be, you know, some big shoes to fill. You know, you're coming in and he had Jan Hammer. I mean, this is, you know, did you listen much to what was that before and take some of that in? Or? Oh, uh, oh, yeah, that was very intimidating, as you can imagine. My first question to Jeff when he said it was, I was, I, I was like, Jeff, I'm not Jan. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, don't worry. He was like, it's like, I, He's like, no spotlights, no solos, just hold it down. I was like, Jeff, I'm your man, I got this. <laughs> I think he wanted that spontaneity to be for him. And for the, for the rest of us, like we said, it's very much just keep an eye on him. Like, we, you know, we, we follow and we, we are that trusted support network. And it, obviously, Jeff had such an in incredible sort of switch up throughout his career. It was just, that was where we were for, the, for this record, for this tour. Um, so yeah, very, very, very happy to fill that space for him and be. And be probably a lot of confusion for Robert because there's so many versions of one particular song out there that nobody was really clear, I think, with you at the beginning, right, as to which version we were playing. So Yeah, just a clue of which key. Yeah, you might have found something. <laughs> <laughs> you might have been listening to something on Bacola and it was, you know, we played it that way and, it, you know... It, Ten years. So. It took uh, about three days of rehearsal before we finally were like, "Oh, oh you're it's that version. It's a different version." Oh. Uh, yeah, we. Yeah, it was quite fun putting the show together from that point of view. Yeah. The the younger crowd out here has challenges ahead of them where they've got to make decisions and choices of possibly having an opportunity for a job that might turn into a good gig, or something that might just be average. How do you make that choice of knowing what, you know, where your heart should follow? opportunities aren't always there so to turn something down that you think could be killer is not wise you might fall on your face but to not chase it you're always going to be wondering that could have been the best thing of my life part of the business is being a juggler you need to learn how to juggle so and juggle those decisions and um it just happens you you got to do it because you love it first of all i think Go, go with your heart and go with the music. But we're professional jugglers. You know, you have to take that chance and take that risk and see what it, see what it brings you. That's what music is about. You never know who you're gonna play with, who's, who's in the audience, who's seeing you, what one thing is going to become another. It's just a constant thing. But I've been a juggler my whole life. And it's, it's just part of the business, I think. You never know. That's the great thing about it too. You just don't know. Beautiful. And faith. Have faith in yourself. I look in this room, and I know there are so many genius drummers in here and genius musicians, and faith. And one thing is our confidence. We all have to pray and work on our confidence, our inner confidence. It's a daily thing. Your inner confidence and your faith can help you. It's really important that you think about that, and you meditate and you pray about it so you can keep the faith 
to pursue because it's not easy. It is not easy. I can't tell you how hard I prayed. How would I ever make it? How would I ever make it? But it did pay off to go and meet John McLaughlin, to actually make the effort to go and meet him. So go out of your way to meet the people you want to meet. But have the faith in your ability, you know? Play your heart out. Play your heart out. And those of you who know, know what I'm talking about. Play your heart out. You're given this chance in life to do the music? Be grateful and let it speak it. Woo! Very much. Great question. I, 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 I want to say one thing. The intensity level is so high yeah. that when you're doing five shows a week and you're traveling on buses and you're tired, how do you get the strength to play with that intensity that Jeff goes to with the sound of the marshals? And, and I would draw strength from the lights. You see that light up there and that light up there? I would see like Santa Claus. I would see Mother Mary. I would see everybody come. Jimmy, I would see all my heroes coming from those lights. It would give me power and inspiration to, to match the intensity for every show that Jeff wanted. It's an incredible thing to do that. It really is. Incredible. Drummers, intense. raise your hand in this audience. <laughs> raise your hand, Will. <laughs> yeah. The power that you have to have to, to, to inspire. It's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. I have to say that. Well, like you said, going from zero to 100 yes. with him, Talk Talk dynamically. Everything going from where were, where were we or where were you, sorry. <laughs> or th these beautiful ballads that he would play to this super 120 just in your face, just <laughs> energy full blast, just a dynamic range, incredible, incredible. And especially for the drummers, absolutely, who have to, to carry that. Yeah. And I want to say, I tuned my left bass drum to be deep. Like the, I call her Mother Earth, but my, my left bass drum would be like Mother Earth, deep to match her intensity. So when I go on that left foot, it'd be purposely low. Just forget the sound effect of that thing coming through. I loved it. And I'd only go there when the Jeff was really, really high. Really, really high. Then we go to the balls to the balls. <laughs> the summation of being with Jeff and your own musical journeys of what you had. I want to start with Robert. Just give me a closing statement of your overview experience as you look back in your life and you look at the years working with Jeff. What did that mean to you? Incredibly pre precious memories. Um, but I think one of the things was... Uh, Sort of, there's always a, a third, fourth, fifth idea to be mined. There's always other places to look and to go. And almost to play something correctly is kind of like the ground floor, the first entry. But to play something incorrectly, to really challenge and to, to be fun with it and, and do something extraordinary is, is, is brilliance. And it, just to push the envelope beyond, beyond, beyond. And that's truly inspiring to me. Robert Adam Stevenson, thank you so much. Beautiful. <laughs> Jen. I'm just going to say I've gotten this far without crying, and I'm not going to get any further, so I'm going to oh. pass. Okay. Rhonda. The most beautiful spiritual experience musical of my of my life. I never thought it would end, um, and it has. So I am just so grateful for him. I loved him. Loved his music. I miss him dearly. I have traveled the world with this man. Been in so many different reincarnations of his group for like 13 years. I just, uh, I'm so blessed mm. to have had this experience. I can't, I can't, it's hard to even put it into words. I will remember it and cherish it for the rest of my life. Beautiful, Rhonda Smith. <laughs> Thank you.
No. Jeff, Jeff was so kind to me. I always loved seeing him wear his white high top shoes. And I called them his high flyers. And I said, Jeff, would you wear the high flyers tonight? And he said, yes, I'll wear them. And he would. And it would just be the most coolest thing to be rocking with Jeff. And, and he'd have his white hot shoes on. And just be flying. I just, I love that about him so much. I want to say I just um, really miss him. I want to say that the tender moments of playing uh, Curtis Mayfield's People Get Ready was always beautiful. I want to say that he loved Les Paul. To do homage to Les Paul was always beautiful. And his love of people and the great music. Um, Jeff was an interpreter. And um, so much control he had. It's really daunting, the amount of control that Jeff has. I just have to just really just give him the love, respect um, that he deserves. And he would love us taking this time right now for him. God bless you all. And thank you so, so much for this beautiful day. I wasn't able to go to this funeral in London. This is my funeral. This is my time to give love back in public for the love he gave all of us. God bless you. Not a Michael Walden. Beautiful. Robert, Jennifer, Rhonda, Narada, you, know, it's, you, you bring a presence. It really is simple. Jeff Beck lives. Jeff Beck lives. And he lives in the responsibility of all of us, each one of you, to take his music in, feel the emotion, feel the joy, and then pass that and share that with somebody. See, sharing it allows you to then spread this feeling that the world, if ever, this world needs to have the spread of joy, bring Jeff Beck's music more to the world and allow this world to kind of find a better place of healing. Absolutely for sure. Nice there is a music is not just what we do it is who we are there's a responsibility that comes with that you know as in hearing them speak and, and uh, listening to Jeff Beck through all these years I've kind of come up with my five P's my five P's the first P is purpose to live a purposeful life Jeff Beck lived a purposeful life he lifted people, he inspired people, he brought a whole nother level of uniqueness of music, the language of music, to the world. And his music will continue to do that. Purpose. The second P is power. You see, once you discover your purpose, you then find power. It motivates you, it gives you commitment, it gives you responsibility, it drives you. So the second P is power. The third P, is peace. You see, you have to be at peace with yourself. As I did this past year of being dragged through the basement of hell, I had to find peace. You know where you find peace? In powerful music. Jeff can heal you in his music. Peace. Once you understand peace, the fourth P is pleasure. You see, that's kind of what we're here for in this world, to seek pleasure and have pleasure. Music does that, and an artist like Jeff Beck will always give you pleasure from 50 years ago to 50 years in the future. The fourth and the fifth P is passion. As you heard from each of these artists speaking, they are filled with the deep essence of passion. Passion is your fuel. It is your fuel. Use it wisely. There's a power in every choice. Choose wisely to push that passion to a level that drives your purpose, your power, your peace, and your pleasure from that passion. We believe in all of you to carry this message out. The Sessions panel, Jules Follett, our angelic leader, makes all of this happen. Each year as we've done this for over a decade at NAM, we're honored to be here. We want to see more of you drive it, but we believe in you. And because we believe in you, there comes a responsibility. We believe in you. We only ask one thing from you. Prove us right. Prove us right that you can be the generation that goes out there, 
shares music, shares Jeff Beck, shares the wisdom of these great artists, and lift music to a higher level to bring this world to a better place. You can do that. We believe in you. We thank you so much. Please enjoy your time here at NAMM, and thank you so much. Beautiful. <laughs>